chapter 6, verses 30 through 56. And if you would please stand for the reading of God's word. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away into the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. And when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things, and when he grew late, the disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy something for themselves to eat. And he answered them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy two hundred denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups and on the green grass. So they sat down in groups, by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them, and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces and of fish, and those who ate the loaves were five thousand men. Immediately, he made his disciples get into a boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up to the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost, and cried out. For they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. And they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the boats. But their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret and moored to the shore. And when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him and ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he came in villages, cities, or countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. And let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before you now and thank you for the word that you've given to us. We pray that as you hear it proclaimed, as you give me the words to speak, that you would be honored in this moment. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning, I would like you to consider a key mark of our Southern Baptist identity. I'm not thinking about what we officially believe about our belief in believers' baptism, regenerate church membership. I'm not talking about our commitment to mission and evangelism or even our congregational authority together. But I'm thinking about something that's a bit more informal. We haven't taken a vote on it. I don't think I'm out of compliance with the bylaws. And I'm saying that one of the key Southern Baptist distinctives that we have is that we like food. <laughs> Uh, the church potluck is nearly as Baptist, this is nearly a Baptist distinctive as just about anything else that we believe. And especially in the South, you're about as likely to find barbecue as a chicken casserole at any potluck. Right? Many of you in the room I know are masters of combining the good gifts of God. Pork, chicken, flour, grease, salt, sugar, into something very delicious. As we consider food today, I would like you to think about the most memorable meal you've ever had. Think about the most memorable meal you've ever had. 
So what do you remember about that meal? Maybe you remember where the meal was, or perhaps the people who you shared the meal with. Maybe it was on a, a set, special setting or occasion like a holiday. What's ironic about the best meal you've ever had is that you probably don't remember the food. You remember everything else, but what you actually had on your plate, you might not remember. Well, as I'm uh, preemptively warm your appetite 30 minutes too early today, I want to invite you to another meal. We're not going to be eating there, but in our text today, it, re it recalls one of the most mem memorable meals in the entire ministry of Jesus. And it's in this memorable meal that Jesus acts as the great shepherd of the people and tends to the leaderless, the hard-hearted, hard-hearted, and suffering people. I'll say that again. In our passage today, Jesus acts as the great shepherd who tends to the people who are leaderless, hard-hearted, and suffering. Last week, we looked at the death of John the Baptist, and that was at a very different type of meal. It was at a banquet. But, and suffice it to say, I don't think, uh, well, although it was a different meal, I don't think it's at all coincidental that we see this banquet where John the Baptist dies, and the very next scene is a large meal, meal where Jesus is providing for thousands of people. You see, we talked about this last week, the apostles had just returned from their ministry. Jesus had sent them out two by two to teach, to cast out demons, to heal. And whenever they come back, you can imagine the excitement they experience, but Jesus knows that they need a season of refreshment. They need to withdraw for renewal. And so he decides to take them, it says in uh, uh, verse 31, to take them away to a desolate place. Uh, some of your translations may say into the wilderness or into the desert. Uh, Samantha and I last May had the opportunity, opportunity to go to Israel, and a lot of what's called the desolate place is not actually desert, it's actually rather lush, but there's, it's not inhabited, there's not people who live there. And so Jesus wants to take them away so that they can be renewed, but as soon as they get across the lake, they go across the lake to a retreat. As we've seen again and again, Mark, a crowd shows up. But this doesn't surprise Jesus. It doesn't make him upset that his plans change. Sometimes whenever our plans change, it makes us quite upset, doesn't it? Uh, on our second wedding anniversary, this would have been three and a half years ago now, uh, Samantha and I went to Atlanta, and we saw a play on a Friday night, and I was under the, uh, you know, I, I was under the belief that our hotel, our lodging, was only going to be about 15 minutes away, downtown Atlanta. But we get in the car, and we're already delayed 30 minutes at 11 o'clock at night because of an accident. And then we keep driving west, and we keep driving west. And our lodging was 45 minutes away, not 15. So it was a change of plans. I should have known, uh, as Samantha told me later on, that I knew this beforehand. But I was rather upset, and I was literally huffing as we went to Carrollton, Georgia, to stay at our hotel. My restful vacation had a hiccup, and it just made me so upset. But Jesus does not respond in this way, right? Whenever he sees that these people are around him and that they're, in verse 34, they're sheep without a shepherd, it doesn't elicit frustration or anger, but rather it elicits compassion. In the Old Testament, there are several times when Israel is said to be like sheep without a shepherd. One of those is in Numbers 27. Uh, you may know the story of Moses, and that towards the end of his ministry with Israel, God told him to speak to the rock, to bring forth water, and he struck it. And as a result of striking water and disobeying God, God said, you're not going to be able to go into the promised land. Well, as Moses looks at the people of Israel who have complained with him for 40 years through the wilderness, he knows that they are a hard-hearted people who will constantly bicker and tear apart the Lord's leaders. He looks to God and he says, well, these people are like sheep without a shepherd. How are they going to make it to the promised land with their stubborn hearts like this? And so for this reason, God actually appoints a man full of the Holy Spirit to be the shepherd of Israel. He appoints Joshua, Moses' successor, to shepherd the people. But whenever you think of sheep without a shepherd, it makes you think of maybe an unruly bunch, right? They're wandering around aimlessly, in no direction, there's nobody to lead them. There's no one to guard them from their enemies. Right? They wander off in random directions. And so, you might really criticize the sheep for this. Why are you guys doing this? But the criticism that they're sheep without a shepherd is also on the shepherds. Where are the shepherds? Where have they been? 
But first off, who are the shepherds? Who are the shepherds of Israel? If you, if you read through the Old Testament, again and again you see people who are the leaders of Israel. In whatever capacity that may be, they're called the shepherds. So it could be the priests or the prophets. It could be the king. And time and again, these groups of people fail Israel. They're not seeking their own good. The, the, sheep, the, the faithless shepherds, will, whenever things are good, they tell people, you don't have to be faithful to God or living high on the hog. And when things are bad because God's bringing judgment, they say, don't worry about that. God is, he's got it okay. Don't worry. There's no judgment. God's going to take care of everything in the end. And whenever God is really telling the people that there's more judgment to come, they tell them that the judgment's almost over. But rather than feed the sheep, rather than care for them and do what's best for them, the shepherds eat the sheep. They take advantage of them. They sell them out. And it leads to the point where, as we read in Ezekiel 34, God has to look to the shepherds of Israel and condemn them and say, I'm not going to let you be shepherds anymore. Rather, I myself have to step in. There was one good shepherd in Mark who cared for the people, John the Baptist, and, well, you saw what happened to him. So, as we think about the absence of Israel's shepherds, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they're not taking care of them. But what about the sheep? Let's think about them. As the crowd runs to Jesus madly, there's a strange, a fine line between their desperation and eagerness. But again, the way that Jesus responds to this crazy situation is compassion. And it's a compassion that doesn't just stand alone. It's not just a feeling that he has in his heart. But rather, as Jesus feels compassion, it leads him to action. And so it should be for all of us. But first, it says he begins to teach them. In verse 34, he saw they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. Again, like many times in Mark, we don't know exactly what he said. But we can imagine he's talking about the kingdom of God. He's talking about the Old Testament, the law, and the prophets, and he's teaching it to them so that they will know how to follow the Lord. But this isn't all that Jesus does. You know, his teaching session, it goes long. And so his disciples approach him, and they remind him of the time, just in case he forgot. You know, they say, send them home, send them out to the countryside, send them out to the other villages so that they can find something to eat. And Jesus' response must have perplexed them. He says, you give them something to eat. There are 5,000 plus, there are only 5,000 men, not counting the women and children, over 5,000 people present. And he looks to the disciples and he says, you, you find them something to eat. I don't think they were expecting Jesus to tell them to set up a catering company. They, they respond, Jesus, do you really expect us to feed all these people? It's going to take 200 denarii. That is 200 days worth of wages to feed this whole group. And if you remember, earlier in chapter 6, you told us to leave our wallets at home. But what does Jesus do? He stands there undeterred. In verse 38, he says, How many loaves do you have? And they, you know, scrounge up a whopping five loaves and two fish. That's how we know that this group was not a group of Baptists, because they only had five loaves and two fish for 5,000 people. But as Jesus takes command of the scene, he organizes the crowd and tells them, City groups of 50s and 100. And then, where do the groups sit? Verse 40. So they, uh, or rather, verse 39, he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. Now, I find the description of the grass fairly interesting. You know, of all the truths that Mark could communicate to us, of all the words he could use, he decides to tell us what color the grass is, green grass. Why did he say that? I think it's because as Jesus sees the people as sheep without a shepherd, he knows that he is going to be their shepherd. He is the descendant of David. He's the Messiah. That means that he's the king, the right king of Israel. But I think it harkens back even more to Psalm 23. You know this psalm. How does it start off? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. What does he do? He makes me lie down in green pastures. He makes me lie down in green pastures. As Jesus performs this miracle of feeding 5,000 men, their women and children, I think that he is consciously assuming the role as the shepherd of Israel. Right? He knows, as God said in Ezekiel 34, I myself, I will be their shepherd, and I'll send David's heir to become the prince who's going to rule over them as too. 
Well, as we confront Jesus, we know that Jesus is the God of Israel, made flesh in human form. And so he is becoming the shepherd, the great shepherd, the good shepherd of the people. And so as he feeds the people and as he teaches them, he's caring for the sheep, for Israel. He seeks and finds the lost sheep of Israel. And as he divides the bread, it's interesting to me, but this is the detail I have to emphasize the time. But as he divides the bread, it multiplies. I don't know how good you may have been at long division, but I hope you can appreciate the Lord's division, right? As he divides and multiplies. And like the crowd that Jesus is preaching to is the crowd he's feeding, we too need a shepherd. I know in your life you may have experienced a leader. You may have experienced a shepherd, maybe in church, maybe somewhere else, who's not cared for you. That's led you and the rest of the flock to stray. Maybe you've experienced neglect. Or maybe just the absence of a shepherd led to somebody else, the enemy coming in and hurting you. And so, like the crowd here today, I invite you to come to the, come to the shepherd. Come to Jesus, the chief shepherd. He'll care for you. Remember, the Psalm 23 says, The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord Jesus is our shepherd. Well, while this miracle of Jesus feeding the 5,000, as it illustrates that Israel needs a shepherd, and it illustrates our need for a shepherd, the next scene demonstrates how hard it can be to see that fact. In verse 45, Jesus sends the disciples over to the other side of the lake. And he goes up on the mountain because he needs to spend time in the fellowship with his father. He goes up to the mountain to pray. But at the fourth watch of the night, this is right before the sun rises, he can see... He's able to, you know, he's got God's vision, so he sees across the lake, and he sees the disciples are having a hard time getting across. And so he walks to them, and probably like you and I would be if we were in the middle of the night, in the middle of the lake, and we look up and we saw a man walking by the lake. The disciples are terrified. They, their hearts, they, they fear, and Jesus has to say to them, don't worry. It's, it is I. Calm your hearts. But whenever we think about Jesus, Walking on the water. And this is an amazing miracle. I was telling someone earlier, you know, with all the rain that we've had recently, it's comforting to know that God walks on the water. But I, I think, again, this is pointing to the reality that Jesus is the God of Israel. I'm going to read a portion of Psalm 77. In Psalm 77, the psalmist is recounting, uh, in a very poetic and musical way, God's deliverance of Israel from Egypt and Exodus. And they went through the Red Sea. And it says this in Psalm 77, verse 16 and following. When the waters saw you, O God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. Indeed, the deep trembled. The clouds poured out water. The skies gave forth thunder. Your arrows flashed on every side. The crash of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Your lightnings lighted up the world, and the earth trembled and shook. Your way was through the sea, your path through the great waters, yet your footprints were unseen. The psalmist knows that God was with Israel as they went through the Red Sea. That God was also with them walking on the water. They didn't see him, but he was there. And now as the disciples are in the middle of the sea, and their lives, they're not, their lives are not quite in peril, but they're not able to get through it, Jesus walks on the water beside them to help them get through. The one who they call Rabbi had another name, Jehovah. And he, as he comes into their distress, he gets in the boat, and the winds cease. He has control over creation. This is the shepherd who not only makes the sheep lie down in green pastures, but what does he do? He leads them beside still waters. But the response of the disciples is what I think is more significant for us today. As we think about our own lives, as we think about how we would respond to the acts of Jesus. Because in verse 51 and 52, it says, They were literally astounded. For they did not understand about the loaves, and their hearts were hardened. This, this is pretty complexing, isn't it? The twelve disciples had been going around with Jesus. They'd just been on their own ministry tour that was successful. They've seen Jesus feed 5,000 people, and they've seen him walk on water. And their response is that their hearts are hardened. they become, as they've seen God work, they've become more like Pharaoh than they have like Jesus. And more interesting is the fact that it says their hearts were hardened because they didn't understand the bread. I mean, what, what does that mean? Well, I think there's a few causes of hard-heartedness. And I want to review those today. Some of these may sound familiar. But I think there's three underlying conditions that could be afflicting the disciples. And I think that we're at risk of them afflicting us as well. 
First, I think that the first problem that disciples face is that their astonishment and amazement falls short of faith. Verse 51 says that they were astounded, and if you're reading the King James Version, it says that they wondered at this fact. But as we've reviewed several times in the past few weeks, astonishment, faith, or sorry, astonishment, wondering, amazement, it falls short of faith. And part of the question is, what is faith? What is true faith? Now, here's a definition I'll give you, as I think we see faith in the Gospel of Mark. Faith is a totalizing trust that God is who He says He is, and He will do what He says He will do. Let's say that again. Faith is a totalizing trust that God is who He says He is, will do what he said he will do. The Bible says that we're justified by faith apart from works. And we would do well to remember that the caution of James that he said faith without works is dead. Another way we may even say that is that true faith works. Alright, if, if God says that he's going to save you through the fiery furnace, the way that you trust God is by going into the furnace. Whenever Jesus says feed 5,000 people, the way that you demonstrate your trust in Jesus is that you feed 5,000 people knowing that He will provide. He amazes them, but they don't believe. Again, we've talked about this. There are many people who will give Jesus a pat on the back. We really like what you said in the Sermon on the Mount. There's a lot of good stuff in there, Jesus. But all this other business about taking up the cross and following you to, to, the, to the grave, I don't want to do that. All this business about following the Word of God even when it hurts, I'll take something else. Astonishment falls short of faith. So that could be one thing that leads to hard heartedness is that astonishment is not faith. The second, I believe, that the disciples' pride could get in the way of understanding Jesus' miracles because they fail to marvel at what Jesus has done. Think about the experience they've just had. They have been able to go out and cast out demons, they've been able to go out and heal people. And maybe they have come back prideful thinking that, well, Jesus can do some of this stuff and I can do some of it now. And all of a sudden Jesus does something that transcends their categories of what God does. Their puffed up view of themselves has led to a diminished view of Jesus and ultimately to a diminished view of God. Here's one question to ask yourself, whether or not pride may be getting in the way of you trusting God and affecting your heart. Does God need you? Does God need you? We know that God equips every believer with spiritual gifts to serve the church and to accomplish the mission of the gospel. But does God need you? Could he accomplish the mission without you? We need to remember that one time God spoke through Balaam's donkey, and Jesus said, If you don't worship me, even the stones will cry out. God does not need us, but he chooses to use us. Like the disciples, we cannot allow the miraculous to become superfluous. Maybe like the disciples, you've participated in the work of God in your life. And he's transformed you. He's delivered you from sin. You've led people to the Lord. And maybe you think that you don't need Him as much as you used to. Well, I'm stronger now. I'm going to do this in my own flesh. I don't need you, God. You can't allow the miraculous to become superfluous. Rather, we need to continue to be amazed by God's work in our life and allow it to result in trust. So... Let's review one symptom of hard-heartedness. One cause of it could be the lack of faith. The second one could be pride in life. And third, and I think maybe the one that's the most dangerous for us today, is that we doubt the Lord's goodness. We doubt the Lord's goodness. If you think about how the disciples respond to Jesus, whenever he tells them something, whether it's feeding the 5,000 people or even seeing him in the middle of the lake, they didn't expect Jesus to be there. Whenever Jesus said, feed 5,000 people, they didn't assume that Jesus had their best interest at heart. Why, Jesus, why don't you, did you miss the time? You need to sit in the moment. Jesus knew the time. But they doubted his goodness. They doubted that he really cared for the crowds, and they doubted that he really cared for them. Charles Spurgeon said that this way, he was preaching on the same passage, and, he, and I think this is really helpful for us. He said, hard hearts and painful unbeliefs spring up in the ways and places where we bury our forgotten mercies. I'm going to say that one more time. Hard hearts and painful unbeliefs spring up in the ways and places where we bury our forgotten mercies. I was talking to a friend this past week who is planting a church in Salt Lake City, Utah. He's ministering to Mormons over there. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but the, the greatest percentage of people who are 
that reach the United States who don't believe the gospel of Jesus is actually in Salt Lake City, Utah, and its surrounding cities. There's a lot of people who are religious, and a lot of people who profess to know Jesus, but they don't actually know the gospel. They believe false things about him. My friends live there for four years. They're starting a church with some other friends. They've got nine people. They meet in a house right now. And I, when I saw him on, on, uh, earlier this week, I said, you know, how can I pray for you? You know, how are things going? And he said, Ryan, it's hard to not be cynical. I've seen just about everything try here for four years. And every single thing we do, it just seems like there's not fruit coming from it. And these are people who, they go out in the streets and they're evangelizing in the streets. They go out to public events and they get to know the people there and invite them to the church to get to know them. They're doing so much for the gospel. You can't charge them with laziness. But he said, it's hard not to be cynical. And so my prayer for my brother, his name is Zach, and for his church is that, Lord, that he wouldn't forget the Lord's goodness. And I, and I pray that for us too. That as you think about how God has been faithful to you in the past, has been faithful to Dale in the past, and maybe you're experiencing something different now, and you wonder, why is God even letting me go through this trial? If you read the story closely, it wasn't until the disciples were in the middle of the trial that Jesus actually showed up. And so today, I don't know what you're going through. I know that there's different situations in every family and home represented in the room today. But don't doubt the goodness of Jesus. He is the shepherd of the flock. John Gospel of John, he says, I am the shepherd. We can trust him. Maybe your heart condemns you. First John 3, 20 says that if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our hearts. So as we think about Psalm 23, the Lord Jesus is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down, or he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters, and he restores my soul. Let's look at the very last paragraph, starting in verse 50. As soon as they get to the other side, the crowds come back, and the people are flocking to Jesus from the cities, from the villages, from the country. They come and they bring their sick. These are people whose their soul, their life is in danger. And what does Jesus do? He continues to be compassionate, merciful, and heal them. It says, as many as are able to touch his garment, just like the bleeding woman, just like those in Mark chapter 2, whenever Jesus healed the paralytic. Brought him on, they brought him on a stretcher. Jesus heals all of them. I mentioned that the truth that we hear at Mark today, this was as much for the people of Israel then as it is for us today. We too need healing. We need the Lord to restore our soul, to restore our life. And Jesus, Jesus does this on the cross. See, by dying on the cross for our sins, he bears the punishment that we deserve for sin. And he didn't stay dead, but he got up from the grave three days later. And so it doesn't matter what trial we're going through. It doesn't matter what hardship we're experiencing. If we're found faithful in the Lord Jesus, if we believe him by faith and we repent of our sins, the Bible says that we too can get up from the grave one day. It's the same healing that everyone else experienced one day. We will have transformed bodies that will experience that healing as well. And so I would encourage you today to come to the shepherd. Come to the shepherd, Jesus Christ who wants to care for you. I'm going to be standing down front in just a minute. Jonathan's going to be singing a song behind us, but we can all be singing together. And if you don't know Jesus, or maybe you've been far from Jesus for a long time and you need to come back, I'll be standing in the back and I'd love to pray with you as you come to the shepherd. If you would, please bow your heads with me.